Oracle's reference architecture for information management has been built on many years of success of information delivery by our customers. In this session, we'll introduce the architecture framework and explain the major constituent parts. The reference architecture has three main parts. It comprises of information sources, a layer for an enterprise data warehouse, and a layer for information consumption. We then add elements such as ETL, messaging and metadata, and then security. The information sources layer represents all potential sources of raw data which would be required by the business to address the information requirements. The most obvious source type is internal operational systems. They do the bulk of the IT work of the organisation. I've drawn this as an information store in a logical sense, but the physical implementation of this does not matter. It could be just a messaging flow, for example. We see lots of requirements for accessing externally sourced or syndicated data in combination with data from the operational systems. Other than the external nature of the data, there is typically no need to provide any special accommodation for this data in the rest of the architecture. Increasingly, we're seeing requirements for unstructured data analytics to be combined with data from more structured systems. I draw this here to identify that our architecture can deal with these data types, but in essence, unstructured data can be treated in exactly the same way as structured data. A special case of operational systems is commercial off-the-shelf packages, for example, those used for ERP. As we shall see later, these can be treated as a special case, particularly if pre-built analytical applications are available for these systems. The next layer is the enterprise data warehouse itself. This will be responsible for delivering the bulk of the information to the information consumers. I'm often asked how many data warehouses an organisation should have, and my answer is always to aim for the minimum number, ideally one. Of course, there will be exceptions to this, and some very, very large and sufficiently siloed organisations may get away with having a small number of enterprise data warehouses. But ultimately, if our main concern is one version of the truth, a single enterprise data warehouse is what we should be aiming for. Perhaps it's instructive here to consider what is not on the diagram as well as what is. There is no operational data store. There are no data marts. We believe that the purpose of these concepts can all be covered by the enterprise data warehouse itself. There is no need for separate siloed environments, and by avoiding these constructs, we avoid the potential of compromising our single version of the truth. We avoid potential legacy problems inherited as data is moved between technologies. The final layer is the information consumption layer. This is where consuming business users or indeed consuming business processes or even systems are being served. So it houses BI tools as well as a number of other special capabilities. It's worth noting now the shapes used, specifically the inverted L shape from information sources to information consumption. This demonstrates that while we expect the bulk of the information consumption to be served by the enterprise data warehouse, some information may be served directly from the information sources. There are two reasons for doing this. One is as a road mapping technique, as at any point in time, we may not have built the feed into the data warehouse for that piece of information. The second is that we may use this technique for combining real-time operational data with historic data from the data warehouse. Both approaches need to be done with care. There are issues with both data quality and query performance to contend with, as we shall see later. So there you have it. At the highest level, we have just three layers. Of course, the devil's in the detail, and we'll start going through these layers in the next instalments.